Communion Sunday, so if you didn't get a, a, well, some are goblets and some are cups. If you didn't get one of those as you came in, just raise your hand. The ushers will get one to you at this time. Anyone who is Christian is free to participate with us during that communion time comes. I want to say thank you to all those who participated in the catch-up campaign. The final total was $5,630, so thank you very much for your generosity. We appreciate that. I also want to thank those who made the coffee hour possible for us today, and please join us at the other end of the building after worship for a time of fellowship and sharing and get a little bit of energy from food and whatever after we've been depleted from all that good worship we're going to have. Uh, and then about a half hour, 25 minutes afterwards, The Chosen will be shown in the library in the next episode. Also, uh, we're full into a new series now. Peter pictures us as visiting strangers passing through this place called Earth for a brief time. I mentioned, even mentioned last week that Peter referred to his body as a tent that housed his spirit just for this brief time on earth. Therefore, our series image and altar display and wall banner outside uh, the sanctuary represents faithful Christians as hikers and traveling and camping as kind of a temporary dwelling while we're here on earth and representing Christ as we go. So thank you to the worship team who put all that together for us. And then in the tech booth, we have Jim Cleveland. Our musicians today are Kathy Novak, Randy Bell, and Donna Almond. And uh, Mary Jo Bell will be leading most of the congregational singing. And our ushers are Jeff gordon and Jerry Weaver. And Sherry Hart has joined the reading ministry this morning for the first time, so we appreciate that as well. And all of you who are here to worship with us. Today's money verse comes from a story in Matthew 22, 16, 21, in honor of Independence Day, one of the few times that Jesus was forced to talk about the government. Uh, the fair, and I'm just partly summarized and partly quoted. The Pharisees decided to send some of their men along with the Herodians, a Jewish political party, to entrap him by asking, is it right to pay taxes to the Roman government or not? But Jesus saw what they were after, called them out on it, and then answered, show me a coin whose picture is on it and whose name is stamped beneath the picture. Caesar's, they replied. Well, then, he said, Give it to Caesar if it is his, and give God everything that belongs to God. If you have a filled out prayer request, please give it directly to ushers as we now collect the morning offering that belongs to God. The blessings you have poured out on us, we have gathered to offer these gifts of ourselves as a pleasing sacrifice of thanksgiving in the presence of each other. Guide us to use them wisely for the furtherance of your holy and merciful reputation through the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 
Please remain standing for the call to worship, pledges, and first song. We gather together to worship God, who through the blood of Jesus Christ has freed us from the emptiness and futility of our former lives. We have been reborn. We are now children of the living God. Come, let's worship the God who has set us free. Since you are already standing, if you are a veteran, would you please raise your hand so we can acknowledge you? Okay, thank you for your service. And now join us in the pledges first of the American flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. To the Christian flag. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands, one Savior crucified, risen, and coming again with life and liberty to all who believe, uniting all humanity in service and in love, and to the Bible. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word, I will make it a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, and I will hide its words in my heart that I might not sin against God. that from time to time, not often, I have a limp. Um, at times I have sat while preaching to help alleviate whatever hap pains I happen to be having that day. Um, I used to use a knee brace when I could. That didn't always help. Sometimes it did. And I've had an ankle brace on at times, and I've actually had a plantar fasciitis strip from time to time. 
Sometimes the sports helped, sometimes they didn't. If you look around the church, around the town, sometimes you notice that people also have with them different kinds of help for their walking or breathing or whatever relieves whatever ails them. Some people use a cane or a cane that has legs at the bottom of it or a zimmer or we call them in America walkers. Uh, Sometimes they have tennis balls at the end, sometimes just pads, sometimes wheels, sometimes tennis balls. Uh, And some of them have chairs and and or baskets to help us get around as well. Uh, All kinds of nice stuff to help us when we need it. Not everyone who has trouble walking is because of a bad knee or ankle or, you know, it could be all kinds of different things. It could be a hip, it could be a back, it could be a combination of all of them or any of them. And other reasons as well, weak muscles, bad circulation, balance problem, this could go on and on. Not only is it different problems, it could come from different causes. It may be an accident or a disease or the toll of time or many other kinds of reasons. Some people will feel the pain intensely, some others not so much. Sometimes it goes back and forth. And everyone reacts with different sensitivities even if the amount of pain is the same. Sometimes it's not even the person, the body that is the problem, it's the terrain that we're on. People walking on snow use special shoes that look like oversized tennis rackets to get around on snow. Cross-country and downhill skiers use different kinds of footwear as well as sticks to help them steady themselves as they go across the snow or down slopes. And sometimes hikers use walking sticks to help them walk steadily on uneven terrain. The point is, we shouldn't worry about what equipment people use or don't use, what problems people may have, or what has caused them, or why people have the pains they have, or how bad it is, or what kind of terrain they have been walking on. We are all different. We all have different kinds of hurts caused by different things that makes us feel differently. <clears throat> One of my pet peeves is when I'm hurting in some way not always physically, and somebody wants to comfort me, and they start by saying, I know exactly how you feel. (laughs) And then they begin to tell a story about themselves that may, on one or two occasions, may have actually had a very slight connection to what I was going through. But because we're all different, even if it was a very similar thing, it doesn't mean we feel the same about it. Plus, I think I learned somewhere along the way that if you're trying to comfort someone, you don't make yourself the dominant part of the conversation. But the point is, though, we treat others with joy and love and acceptance despite any hindrances that they may have in life and that we may have in life. And it's also an analogy for how we treat each other on our spiritual walks. We have traveled and will travel different paths with different obstacles, rest stops, detours, setbacks, and forward movements. But through all of this, we can know God loves us and supports us and helps us every step of the way. And likewise, our job as Christians is to love and share our joy with them and let them know that God wants to be the walking stick that he has been for us because he has helped us be just that way. Listen to the scripture and introduction. Paul advises us to live in such a way that we do not impede others on their way to and or growing in their trust in God. Later he writes that however the recipients of his ministry team responded to them, whether they believed it or not, they did everything possible to not hinder but to reinforce their faith by the example of their lives. They and we do this because that is what the Lord does for us. David rejoices that God stabilized his life's journey on this earth and prays that he still needs God's attention and help. I waited for the Lord to help me. Then he listened to me and he heard my cry. He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire. 
He set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. He taught me to sing a new song, a song of praise to God. Many will see what he has done and be amazed and will put their trust in the Lord. You have done many things for us, O Lord our God. There is no one like you. You have made many wonderful plans for us, too numerous to list. If I tried to recite all your wonderful deeds, I would never come to the end of them. How I love to do your will, my God. I keep your teaching in my heart. May all who come to you be glad and joyful. May all who are thankful for your salvation always say, how great is the Lord. I am weak and poor and needy, but you have not forgotten me. You have kept me in your thoughts. You are my helper and my savior. Paul writes the Corinthian believers, be careful so, so that your freedom does not cause others who are weak in the faith to stumble and fall into sin. Suppose others whose conscience is weak sees you and your so-called superior knowledge doing something that they say see as wrong. Will this not encourage them to do that same thing? So because of your superior knowledge, this weak believer for whom Christ died will be destroyed. And when you sin against other believers, by encouraging them to do something they believe is wrong, you are sinning against Christ. We live in such a way that no one will stumble because of us, and no, no one will find fault with our work. Instead, in everything we do, we show that we are true servants of God. We serve God whether people honor us or despise us, whether they slander us or praise us. Dear friends in Corinth, we have spoken honestly with you and our hearts are open to you. There is no lack of love on our part. What God does for us in Jesus marks the example of what we do for each other. And one of the primary things we do to avoid tripping up ourselves and others and ushering in peace is the attitude and act of forgiveness. Let's prepare our hearts for prayer by singing, Forgive Our Sins As We Forgive. Let's pray. God of all nations, we thank you for the life and history of our country, for its vast beauty, its wilderness, and wealth of forest, field, and sea. We praise you for its people, whether they've been here for generation, generations or have just arrived. We thank you for the wide variety of our traditions and cultures, the riches of our spiritual and religious heritages the strength of our democracy. We pray for our nation, our citizens, our residents and governments, so that working together, 
We may face the future with confident hope and faith in your purpose for our nation and world. We thank you that in your grace you offer the free blessings of salvation to all who will trust in you through Christ, who took the curse of disobedience for us so that by faith in his work on the cross, we can be reborn and restored. Therefore, as Christians and citizens of this nation, we pray that just as the tree in the forest becomes tall, reaching for the light, may we grow above the shadows of sin, fear, and doubt. As it gives shelter and shade to its friends of fur and feather, so may we help the people that surround us. As the tree sends down roots deep into the soil that it may be nourished, may we be firmly grounded by the love of Christ and sustained by his grace. If a tree falls and decays, it provides nourishment for plants and gives its place in the sun for others. Our Lord and Savior died to make new life and a new place for us. When a tree in the forest is cut down, the wood is used for shelter and fuel. Jesus taught that only when our life is surrendered, when love is poured out, can we build his kingdom and reflect the warmth of his spirit. And as a result, our nation will be blessed as well. May your compassionate grace motivate us to trust your word, follow your will, and bring honor to your name in every situation in our lives and in the life of our nation. So today we offer prayers for those that need them. Pashley requests prayers for friends who have undergone tests and don't have results as yet. We continue to pray for Mark Harper as he recovers from surgery that was scheduled last week, for Matt Eichhorn and his family as he is in hospice, for Jim Malott, who's awaiting test results, for Jan's brother Reese and for son Calvin and their situations, for Sherry Holt's father-in-law Bill with pancreatitis, and others that are on our hearts and minds. Meet each need, physical, behavioral, mental, spiritual, economic, or circumstantial. Meet those needs according to your will. And finally, Lord, we pray and dedicate a quilt for Kathy Tomaszewski, who's having back surgery, and we lift her before you today as we dedicate this quilt. Lord, we ask that you would be near Kathy today. We ask that you would shower her with blessings and fill her with your spirit. We ask that through this quilt, Kathy is renewed in faith, love, and assurance offered by the prayers of this congregation, as well as her trust in you. Let her feel the calm peace of your warming comfort as she wraps this quilt around her. Let it give her confidence that the promise of your presence in our lives is real through difficult as well as in joyous times. We ask that you give her your strength whenever she feels weak and your patient understanding if she should have any challenges on this road to recovery. In all things, let her feel the care and offer we offer to and for her through you. Let her look forward in anticipation to her healing and wholeness and all the abundance of possibilities that you have planned for her life. We pray this blessing through the one who has gone before us and endures forever and teaches us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give Give us us this day our daily bread, bread, and and forgive forgive us our trespasses, trespasses, as we forgive forgive those who trespass trespass against us. us. And And lead us not into temptation, but deliver deliver us from evil. For for thine is the kingdom, kingdom, and the the power, and the glory glory forever. forever. Amen. Today, we move more deeper into the book of 1 Peter. Peter pictures us as people of God whose true home is in heaven. 
We are merely temporary residents in this world. This truth became even more relevant as predicted Christian persecution and martyrdom was probably already breaking out and would soon become state sanctioned. So what do we do while we travel through this earth? Peter wants us to live as faithful sojourners, appreciating and respecting the culture in which we live, loving people, yet responding representing the homeland and its characteristics proudly and in such a way that people indigenous to earth will honor our heavenly home and perhaps even join us on our journey there. He encourages us to do so by reminding us of the new life God has already created for us through Jesus. In response, Peter lays out the kind of people we are to be. So get yourselves ready. Prepare your minds for service. Control yourselves and put all your hope in looking forward as you focus on the gift of grace that will be ours when Jesus Christ returns. In the past, you did not understand, but now you are children of God. So you should obey him as you put aside the evil desires you used to pursue. Since the one who chose and called you is holy, be holy in all you do. For in the scriptures, God says, be holy because I am holy. You pray to God and call him Father. He judges everyone without partiality according to their actions. So while you are living out your days of exile here on earth, you should live with reverence and awe and respect to God. You know that in the past you were living in an empty way it was a way of life you learned from those who lived before you, but you were saved from that useless life. You were bought, but not with things that perish like silver and gold. You were bought with the precious blood of Christ's death, who was like a pure and perfect sacrificial lamb. God determined to send him before the world was made. But he was shown to the world in these last times for your sake. Through him, you trust in God. God raised Christ from the death and gave him honor and glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have made yourselves pure through your own submission to the truth, you can experience real love from each other. So love each other deeply with all your pure heart. You have been reborn. This new life did not come from something that eventually dies, but from something that is eternal and cannot die. You were born again through God's life-giving message that endures forever. For as Isaiah said, all life is like the grass of spring and any glory we enjoy is like the beauty of the wildflowers. The grass dries up and dies. The flowers fall. But the word of the Lord will live forever. This is the good news that was told to you. So then get rid of all hate-driven intentions and deception of hypocritical insincerity and jealousy and slander. Put all these things out of your life. Stop doing anything to hurt others. Be like newborn babies hungry for milk, crying out for spiritual milk, the pure and simple teaching that will help you grow and mature in your salvation. For you have already tasted and examined and found how good the Lord is. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Last week we learned that it is Christ who enables us to shed old life and enter the new life. We remain faithful to it by preparing ourselves to move deeper into that life by craving more and more of Christ and keeping by his side in all circumstances. If comfortable, let's stand up and sing before the series prayer and sermon, My Faith Lives Up to Thee.
Now join me on the yellow font for the worship series response of prayer and musical response. God has mercifully chosen us. There we go. God has mercifully chosen us to be his people, set apart and equipped to represent his excellence. Lord, as members of your kingdom, may we reflect your radiance while we live on this earth. Amen. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Maybe be seated. I think I'm going to be seated today, too. Can everybody see me okay if I'm sitting? Yeah. Okay. Stephen Carter and Julia Sokol wrote a book entitled Lives Without Balance, When You're Giving Everything You've Got and Still Not Getting What You Hoped For, which sounds like a good description of the original people to whom Peter wrote, for they were faithful and yet they're going to be facing persecution. Peter wrote to them about leaving behind the empty and meaningless life from which we have been saved. The co-authors use the imagery of four types of rides that describe the empty life. These are not in-depth metaphors, so don't overthink them. <laughs> They're just topic starters. The first ride is running up the downward slide. Go to the park and you go up the slide, not the steps. But this is not your average park slide. It's too steep and very slippery and we don't have the right shoes and there's a horrible mud puddle at the bottom. In a Frank and Ernest cartoon, one said to the other, the boss said I was the cornerstone of the organization and then I found out they were cutting corners. <laughs> Seems like someone turned off the light at the other end of the tunnel. Stay true to the image. Someone is beginning to push us back down from our upward progress up that slippery slide and down to the puddle where there is no return. It becomes all too easy to stop investing ourselves in anyone or anything. We let the pull of gravity, the weight of external pressures, guide our lives and our attitudes. It's a give up and give in way of life. That's the slide. The second one is the ride is the treadmill. You can always, we can almost imagine what it is already, right? We, we are always exhausted. We are afraid to slow down lest we lose ground or get thrown against the wall like we see in so many video clips now. We expend all of our energy just to keep up in one place, just to survive. And that leaves us no energy for growth or for the more important things and people in our lives. It's a little better than the giving in and giving up mindset, but it fares, it fares less than keeping on trying to keep away. I didn't say that sentence very good. It's a little better than the first ride, but not a whole lot better. Basically just trying to keep up always in life and not getting ahead. The third ride is the roller coaster. One minute we've climbed high with life and work and God, and the next minute we're plunging low. And it isn't an exhilarating thrill. <laughs> we think we're in it for the love of the fast track. We love the stress of success, but with it also comes high blood pressure and ulcers and migraines and all other kinds of things that come with it. It's things that we don't like that much. Our lives are lifted and plunged by our circumstances because we aren't proactive, we just respond to whatever happens to us. We don't run our life, our life runs us. And the last image is the escalator. We step on and we are lifted to success. <laughs> Reminds me of the time when I was a little kid and we were in this mall, I don't remember when it was or where it was, but it was a new to us mall. And they had escalators because one of the stores had a second floor to it. And I, as a little tiny kid, I don't remember how small, uh, 
either anticipated that the family was going up to the second floor, or I was just curious, I don't remember. But anyway, I got on it, and about halfway up, the family said, we're not going that way. <laughs> and so I had to turn around and come back down, except being a little kid, I was kind of afraid to run on this new contraption. And I couldn't walk faster than it was going up, and so I ended up up there. And this was one of those stores where it was kind of weird, where the up escalator wasn't right next to the down escalator. It was somewhere else in the store. And so <clears throat> it took, and I don't know why my family didn't come up, they just went to the other one and called up from the other side. Um, and then I just, finally I figured out where to go and, and got back down and with, the, with my family. So this was an interesting one for me. Um, the escalator on the surface could look like a full and busy life. We're moving up, we're doing things good, it's going up. But in the context of the imagery that our authors are giving, uh, there's no floor to get off at. You're just going. And you're never stopping. There's never enough. You have to keep on going. You're never secure. No matter how much we have or how much we've done, we must keep climbing and climbing and climbing with no purpose or end in sight. The climb is similar to Stephen Covey's ladder of success, empty success. We get to the top and realize there's nothing there. We've leaned our life's ladder against the wrong building. And there's no way to get back down. I'm sure we've all experienced most of these, at least one or two or all of these emotions and life circumstances at one time or another. But there's a difference between experiencing the rides that life throws at us and adapting it as a lifestyle to go through. Peter says that we have been rescued from these and other futile ways of life. We didn't used to grasp God's grace. We didn't used to understand God's grace, so we conformed to the patterns of evil living that was modeled before us and around us. But these patterns led nowhere, or at least nowhere we want to be, only back to evil desires because these are the patterns or the result of leaving God out of the picture and putting selfish control and unhealthy types of gratification at the center. The opposite of this empty life is the whole life, the full life the holy life. Its focus is not on the result of rules or regulations. That would just be another ride we go on. The focus of holiness is to love God and others wholly, with a W, love him wholly. Genuine mutual love is the goal of the holy life. This is the choice that Peter puts before us today. On the one hand, ultimately unsatisfying personal indulgence, which often comes with including harming others to get there, or the pleasure and fulfillment of becoming a people who are loved and loving. So first, a mutual love with God and his people, and his people with God. Peter emphasizes how we live with respect to God. This may go beyond Peter's immediate context, but I don't think it goes beyond biblical thought. Respect has two definitions. So I'm going to play a little word play with you. One, the first definition is when somebody says, in respect to this matter, it's a topical thing. So we live in respect to God, meaning we're always aware of him. (laughs) We consider him. We pay attention to him. He is at the forefront as we choose what we do in life. The second meaning of respect means to honor, to esteem, to give highest regard. So put the two together, and as we go through this life, we are always aware and attentive to God's presence and guidance, and that's an important thing because we are honoring him as a person of wisdom that we follow as we live out each day. I think that's a good way to think about what the NIV describes as living in reverent fear. And then they put a footnote in there that talks about fear, meaning not being afraid, but, in, but living with a wholesome, reverent respect for God as we do everything in our life.
This is important because God does not play favorites, but judges each of us according to our own actions and motivations of those actions, and so we need to be aware of what's going on as we, go, as we decide what we do. The cost of Christ's death on the cross and his resurrection was too deep for God to play games and go along with the games that we play to pretend we're good and holy when we aren't. We may feel like we're building ourselves up or getting ourselves, getting our way by knocking others down, but not in respect to God. Hmm. Mutual love and others with others cannot be pretend any more than it can be with God. Do you remember that classic, popular, secular song, The Games People Play? A couple of the lyrics go like this. Oh, the games people play every night and every day never meaning what they say, never saying what they mean. And while they while away the hours in their ivory towers, people walking up to you saying glory, hallelujah, and then they sock it to you in the name of the Lord. Look around and tell me what you see, what's happening to you and me. God grant me the serenity to remember who I am. Because you've given up your sanity for your pride and your vanity, turned your back on humanity, and you don't care anymore. Games people play. Why are we so many so tempted to play those games? To knock others down, to build themselves up. Why are so many so willing to play the race card, the gender card, the age card, the money card, the wild card, the rules card, but never the love card? Peter hints at it. We play the games in the name of finding our own personal security. And we've been trained by our world that we find that security in a personal nest eggs, in physical resources. Peter says our new lives can't be bought with silver or gold. Peter's not saying there's something wrong with investing in financial reserves. He's not contrasting money and faith as if it's an either or, as if your money is good, if your money is good, then your faith must not be, or vice versa. What he's telling us is that ultimately what will make us secure in the holy life is relying on the eternal promises of God and not on the temporary and tenuous wealth and securities. I love the way he puts it. Peter says that silver and gold is what fades away and perishes. That's not what we think of when we think of silver and gold, is it? We think of those as the lasting kinds of material resource, but no, we, we, he says those are temporary, those are fading away, those are going to perish. Years ago, NASA decided to build a shelter for its huge rockets to assemble them and keep them protected from the frequent Florida rains. It brought in all of its best scientists and think tank experts and techno fixers and engineers, and they finally designed a single hangar-like building bigger than several city blocks. It was said to be the largest single-story building in the world. The problem was that it was so big that it generated its own weather. On humid days, rain clouds would form inside the building below the ceiling. Of course, with all those engineers and techno fixers, they were able to solve the problem, but They thought they were building a shelter and it wasn't secure at all. Sometimes we rely too much on our own programs and proposals and plans for our lives, but no proposal is big enough to protect us from the storms of life or the threat of drifting towards irrelevance. Against these false securities, Peter joyfully proclaims that our faith and hope in God through Christ and he stands beside us no matter how violent are our storms. Remember, many of his readers were either already beginning to or were about to experience literal martyrdom. And it is in this trust that allows us to plant seeds of promise as we obediently live our way into the future God has prepared for us. The holy life responds to Christ by loving God and others through him, or better, allowing him to love others through us. Charles Plum was a jet fighter pilot in Vietnam after 
75 combat missions, his plane was destroyed by a surface-to-air missile. Plum ejected first, then parachuted into enemy hands where he spent six years as a prisoner. Later, he gave lectures about what he had learned from that experience. One day, Plum and his wife were in a restaurant enjoying a meal, and a man at another table came up to him and said, You're Plum! You flew jet fighters in Vietnam for the aircraft, from the aircraft carrier Kitty Hawk. How in the world would you know that? I packed your parachute. I guess it worked. <laughs> Pum replied, if your chute hadn't worked, I wouldn't be here today. And later that night, a sleepless Plum wondered how many times he might have passed him on the Kitty Hawk, seen him and not talked to him because he was a high and mighty fighter pilot and that guy was just a sailor. He imagined the many hours the sailor spent in the bowels of the ship, carefully weaving the shrouds and folding the silks on each chute, holding in his hands each time the fate of someone he didn't even know. Now in Plum Lectures, he asked his audience, who's packing your parachute? Everyone has someone who provides what they need to make it through the day. Two applications. Is Jesus your security chute? As you fly your missions for God? And do you live like we all need each other? As Ben Franklin said to John Hancock, we must all hang together or we will all hang separately. Even we who are in the bowels of life are critical. God judging equally means God will bless us if we do not play favorites with each other on the basis of any perceived betterness or worseness. For God has a positive regard for each person. There are no second-rate citizens in the heavenly kingdom. What he desires for you and me is to be genuinely human together and before him. Therefore, it is love that securely liberates us. Theologian Barbara Taylor Brown talked about her nephew, Will, who was having his first birthday party. The little boy was the center of everyone's attention, and so he did a little happy dance until a jealous seven-year-old named Jason charged over and put both of his hands on Will's chest and shoved, and Will fell down hard backwards, first on his bottom, and then his head hit with a crack. He was utterly stunned. No one had ever hurt him before. He didn't know what to make of it. And then he opened his mouth and howled. He quieted down fairly quickly as his mother helped him up to his feet and hugged him. And then the first thing Will did in his one-year-old walking shoes was to toddle over to Jason, the seven-year-old. He knew Jason was at the bottom of this thing, but since meanness was new to him, he didn't know what to do about it. And so he did what he always did. He put his arms around Jason and laid his head against him, against that mean little boy's body. And Brown said, <clears throat> what Will did to Jason put an end to the meanness in that room. That is what love is. Not only a warm feeling between like-minded friends, but plain old imitation of Christ who took all the meanness of the world and ran it through the filter of his own body, repaying evil for good, Blame with pardon, death with life. Communion reminds us that it is by Jesus' death that we are enabled to choose and live a new life in him and with others. Jesus invites all who love him and who earnestly seek to follow his ways and to live in peace with one another. So let's prepare by a time of confession. Almighty God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart or our neighbors as ourselves, or even ourselves, not always. We gamble with our health, we ignore right living, we choose indulgence over discernment, we separate ourselves from your people and fragment our lives, imagining that we chase distorted drives, that we can chase distorted drives and passions without hurting our spirits. 
But through Jesus, you offer to take us on a kind of ride where we are empowered by our trust in you alone. It's not a ride filled with false securities leading to an empty dead end, but to an exhilaration that can only be found in life in you. We are secure in Jesus, the perfect sacrificial lamb who died for us. Because of your promises in him, we can now set aside the life we lived when we didn't know better and begin to live life for all it is worth because we have experienced how good you are. By your example, we invest in people. We follow Jesus Christ who through the trusted not in his superiority, not in his sinlessness, not in his superior knowledge, but he trusted in you, his heavenly Father, and gave every part of his being to follow in your will. By your mercy, empower us to be and to do the same. So let's continue to prepare our hearts for communion by singing, Take My Life and Let It Be. We receive God's healing. He speaks his peace to us and we shall be made whole. For through the work of Jesus Christ, we have been forgiven. We are forgiven. Therefore, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. For God, you embodied yourself in humanity. You lived out your life among those who were sick physically, mentally, and spiritually. You reached out to touch them. You spoke words to comfort them. You performed miracles to forgive and heal them. You, we thank you that you shared Jesus with us so that we could find forgiveness and be saved. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ and through the Holy Spirit who guides us into all truth, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on all who are gathered here on them these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be the body of Christ together in ministry to all the world until we feast together at his heavenly banquet. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, God, now and forever. Amen. Jesus invited his disciples into an upper room on the night he was betrayed. He took bread. 
He gave thanks to you. He broke the bread. And he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat. And likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup and he gave thanks. And then he offered it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, drink it in remembrance of me. Take and drink. Now, Lord, through your acceptance and grace and forgiveness that is expressed through communion, we cling to our relationship with you. We continue to crave to have our lives shaped by your will. Daily, be it, be it sunny or stormy, encourage us to choose life, to choose love, to choose to listen, and to trust and to obey. Amen. Now with minds renewed and spirits strengthened from the table, let's stand if you are comfortable standing and sing. Now let us rise from this, let us from this table rise. It's still familiar too. As water reflects the face, so one's life reflects the heart. Therefore, as we return to the world to resume our temporary travels on this earth, remember that every decision we make, every action we take, even every word that comes out of our mouth is done in the name of the Lord who is with us every step of the way. Amen. Amen.